very intended reps. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I want to talk about uh, joint work in the ammunition work from Waterloo. And it's going to be on the use paths of given parity in planar graphs. So let me tell you why we need to speak about the used and the way about planar graphs. <coughs> so why in used? So suppose you want to find an odd, given two vertices of T, you want to find an odd, not necessarily induced path between S and T. So if your graph is bipolar, then it's easy because all paths between S and T have the same part, right? So you cannot do anything really, just take the shortest path. <coughs> if your graph is non bipartite right, but to connect it, then, um, to see it, then um, you can find an odd cycle, right? And you can, because of uh, non bipartness because of two connectivity, you can connect from S to the cycle and T to the cycle, right? And if you go from S to T this way, it's going to have a different parity than if you go this way. So one of them is off, the other one is even. By the way, when we say uh, given parity, I will always assume it's off because if it's even or odd, it doesn't really matter. Um, what if it's non bipartite? Well, if it's not bipartite, then uh, you take the not bipartite and not to connect, uh, and, uh, not to connect it. Right? So you take a block decomposition and you work in this block decomposition. And if you have one non-bipartite uh, block between blocks to which S and T belong, then you also have an even an odd path between S and T. So this was observed by uh, in the 80s by the power and Papadimitriou. And in fact, then Papadimitriou with other authors generalized it. So if you fix the integers P and Q, you can uh, you know test in linear time whether there's a path of length P modulo Q between these two vertices. Okay, so that was why uh, why we want to talk about induced paths because odd path not necessarily used is easy. So um, planarity is is necessary, well, not necessarily planarity, but you have to assume something about your input because for general graphs uh, this problem is NP complete. Okay, it was proved by means. And uh, <coughs> so these are the classes of graphs that uh, the problem is known to be solved in polynomial time. Um, they're mostly subclasses of uh, perfect graphs, and that's because people were interested before the strong perfect graph theorem. There was some interest generated by the uh, perfect graph community in finding even pairs, whatever it means. And this is basically the same problem uh, and all the use that that we are studying. And recently, we uh, solved it for cloth-free graphs using the uh, decomposition theorem by uh, Shudnowsky and Seymour, parts of it. So now let me tell you about the solution for planar graphs. Okay, so <coughs> as in many cases, you check the true width of your graph first. Okay, so um, whether it's small or large. And small is a universal constant, which is like 480 in this case. Uh, we didn't optimize this. But uh, <coughs> uh, yeah, we needed to be big enough. And if the true width is small, uh, you solve it by doing dynamic programming, or MSOL, and Bushnell's theorem. And uh, if the true is large, <coughs> what you basically do is um, you want to find a smaller equivalent instance. Okay. So uh, if the true is large, so small true width is we're well done with, and now we are working with large true width. So if true width is large, every plane I graph with big grid minor, with low big grid minor, has small true width. So if the true width is large, you have a large grid minor. But um, in fact, we're going to work with walls. OK, so there's a theorem. So the wall is uh, it's this graph, kind of. And uh, if the true width is big, you can find a grid minor. In the grid minor, you can find uh, a subdivision of a big wall. And you can find it in a planar way. So there's a disk such that uh, whatever lives inside contains a subdivision of a big wall. OK, so, uh, so walls are useful because they give us connectivity. OK, so uh, we'll use the fact that you, know, you can use the infrastructure of the wall when we're working here to root out certain things. But <coughs> OK, so we start with uh, looking at our graph and making all vertices relevant in the sense that if I, if I have a vertex in the graph such that there is no 
induced path from S to T using this vertex. I can delete it because it's never going to belong to any hot induced path. <coughs> this is possible to detect in planar graphs because there is a polynomial time algorithm for induced linkages. And induced linkages is a problem that, you know, it's like linkage, but you want uh, paths to be mutually induced in the linkage. Right, so I'm using this to pre-process the graph, and I assume that every vertex lies on some induced ST path. Um, otherwise, I delete it, and I reverse. Um, OK, so now we're looking at a wall, this one. Um, I'm checking whether the wall is perfect or not. This can be done. Um, not really the wall, but the whole, the whole graph I'm getting here. Right? inside this is this. Okay, so um, so if the wall turns out to be perfect, um, I can show that the vertex somewhere in the middle of this wall is irrelevant. <coughs> Otherwise, if the wall is non-perfect, that means I have an odd hole somewhere here in the wall. I'm trying to play the same you know, game as Papa Dimitri paper. So I'm trying, using this odd hole, I want to connect this odd hole and traverse it one way or the other way to produce the odd instance. And, and beyond zero? <coughs> hmm? Beyond zero? Uh, I'm sorry? Odd zero? Uh, there's no, uh, okay, so... Oh, for planar, 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 okay, so I forgot to say, thank you. So the graph is planar, so being perfect planar means uh, you only, you know, you, you just need to exclude odd holes, anti-holes, holes. Because you cannot have an odd animal, except for C5. OK, so, <coughs> so yes, being, pla being uh, non planar, being planar, non perfect, means that you have an odd hole. Um, so if the wall is not perfect, then it means I have an odd hole, and uh, I'm trying to use this approach. But now there's a problem. So, <coughs> so, so the fact that it's non-perfect and not non-bipartite uh, gives me some advantage that this all cycle is going to be an odd hole. Because if, I, if it was a triangle, then uh, I couldn't really use it. Right? If I have right here. <coughs> so if I can connect from S to the triangle and T to the triangle, and say this is the odd way, then I cannot use it because it's not in use. But if it's an odd hole, then it's fine. Okay, so, uh, so, so this helps, but uh, the problem is that <coughs> now because I care about connectivity, I may have these gates, right? So we call them gates. So if you have an odd cycle and you connect the odd cycle, you, you don't connect in one point. You can attach to many vertices. <coughs> and um, um, you can define gate parity. So gate parity is the length of this path, you know, inside the, the bounding edges. So, so the problem is that we have gains because if we have attached to an odd cycle of hole with gain, uh, gains of the same parity, then I cannot do anything. Oh, you have different part. They have different part, right? So, um, with this, this is an odd cycle. And um, this is one and this is zero, so they have different parity, and the whole thing is even, so traversing it this way or this way gives the same parity of the path. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's another potential problem. <coughs> the third thing is that I want to keep the path in use. So I cannot really reroute too much because um, I don't want to create edges, say, between here and here as well, right? So I, the other things I have to remember. Okay, so... Now suppose we have um, a high connectivity between, so, so I'm working in this wall, and in this wall I, uh, I, can, find, um, I can find a collection of cycles, nested cycles. So they're going to look like this. Okay? And uh, I'm taking the outermost cycle, which I call the boundary of the wall. And so this is the boundary, and this is the odd hole that comes from non-perfectness. It's green, if you can see. Um, so if I have six vertex disjoint paths between the boundary and the odd hole, then what I can do, I 
look at the triples. There are two triples. This, 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 and this, this, this. If you look at this triple, <coughs> any two paths are mutually induced. So there's no, no edge between this path and this path because of planarity. There's a path between them. Okay, and if you have three um, paths like this, if you look at the gate parity, this parity and this parity and this gate parity, then what happens is that two are going to be the same. Okay, so then I can avoid this problem. <coughs> and uh, if I can also connect from S to the boundary of the wall and T to the boundary of the wall, then I'm good. But six connectivity is too much to ask because this, this odd hole can leave somewhere here inside the cycle and it's not well connected to the boundary of, this, of the wall. Uh, so what if there are only four paths? Well, it, it happens that uh, there are only four paths, then either I can well connect, and well connect means you know, that I find uh, a way of connecting so that I traverse it one way and produce a different part in the other way, or I find another odd hole, which is sort of bigger. So suppose I, uh, I started with, with this small odd hole, and I, I cannot well connect to it, so I can find another one, which contains this one in its interior. Okay. So you can draw the odd hole. And the boundary of the wall, you can prove that the boundary is supposed to be bipartite, right? because otherwise I can produce the odd path between us and T. <coughs> so if you are growing this odd hole, at some point you're going to hit the boundary. So it means you, yeah, you better stop before. OK, so this is the high connectivity thing. <coughs> so I have to speed up a bit. Uh, so this is basic, basically saying the same thing, that if, if I have four connectivity between the boundary and the cycle, I'm, I'm good. And otherwise, um, I have a cut. And when I have a cut, then it gets a bit more messy, <coughs> because I have to consider this, what we call mimicking gadgets. So I have a, say, three cut. Um, I'm trying to mimic what's happening on one side of the cut by replacing the whole thing by this gadget. So I make my instance smaller. And, um, OK, so this is the non-perfect case. So I have a, I'm trying to connect to the hole. If possible, then it's a yes instance. Otherwise, it produces a smaller instance. If the graph is perfect, if the wall is perfect, then <coughs> that's the missing uh, theorem from before. Um, I'm using a composition theorem for playing a perfect graph that is due to so from the it's from the 80s. Um, I guess you can just deduce it from the strong perfect well from the, the composition theorem for perfect graphs, but uh, this was custom tailored for um, uh, playing at perfect graphs. So we can uh, we can produce uh, the composition tree of a planar graph. It's a tree so that uh, vertices of t are graphs. H is the root and if a vertex of t admits one of the four basic cut sets I'm going to talk about in a second, then as children and graphs built according to given rules. <coughs> and um, so then at the end you decompose along these cut sets, so the children are uh, prime with respect to these the, the, the cut sets. And these are the cut sets, okay? So it's not really very important, but there's only four types, and each cut set carries with it, a rule, how to replace, you know, they, they also have some sort of mimicking gadgets. So let's look at the rule number three in details. <coughs> the rule number three says that if you have um, a cut set like this, where AD is, is an edge, AC is a non-edge, and BC is whatever, then um, if also there's an induced AC path in every, con these are connected components. If I remove a cut set, I have a number of connected components. Um, uh, in, in each component, and there's an odd induced BC path in each connected component, then what I'm supposed to do is to build a gadget like this. Okay? And you can see that it mimics the uh, existence of a path because you know, here we assume that there is an um, even AC path. So AC path is an even AC path somewhere in the component. So now I can mimic it because it's like one, two, right? And for an odd BC path, there was a path here, now I can one, two, three, go like this, and I preserve parity, and I preserve 
induced this. Okay, so this is the uh, so decomposition, and then when you decompose along these cuts, that's what's happened with the children, with the leaves, is that they are either comparability graphs of a special type, and this is really important for us, <coughs> such that they contain an independent set of vertices, they're called C4 vertices, and a C4 vertex is a vertex whose neighborhood induces a C4, okay? Uh, such that once you remove these C4 vertices, you have a bipartite graph. Or is a line graph of a bipartite graph, or is one of 10 exceptional graphs, which are small. So this is the composition theorem. It can be found by volume of time. So now, first, we handle C4 vertices. And if you look at this picture, you can, you can convince yourself that um, without loss of dependency, you can always split this vertex in this way. So if you have a vertex, a C4 vertex, you, you produce um, four new vertices and connect them the way, um, the way I drew it. So uh, I don't think I have time to explain um, this reduction, but basically you can always assume there's no C4 vertices. And uh, what happens is that uh, this part uh, becomes simplified. So we have three basic classes. This simplifies, this stays as it is, and I don't really care about uh, the exceptional graphs. So I have to only handle two different classes of graphs, which are plain and bipartite, or line graphs or bipartite graphs. And you know, the way I do it in the wall is that uh, it's the most technical part of the paper is to show that you can always reroute. So basically the idea is that um, if you have a bipartite graph, all paths between, so, so you look at a, you know, this is, this is your wall. You have an ST path and you, you look at a way the ST path intersects the wall. Now, if it intersects like this, and remember this is a bipartite graph. So every path in a bipartite graph between this vertex and this vertex will have the same parity. So I, I don't really have to use a vertex from the middle if this original path used the vertex in the middle. I can route it any other way, which avoids this vertex, and I'm fine. I respect inducedness and I respect parity. But uh, what can uh, happen also is that you know the path enters the wall and then goes out and then there's enters again. But uh, <coughs> because say a path from here to here is even. And if I go through here, I get an odd path. So sometimes I may need a parity changer. So I have to show that I can connect, I can connect this to here and this to here, avoiding the middle vertex. So this is, as I say, the uh, most technical part. And this can be done because of planarity. So I mean, things get messy, but planarity preserve, uh, you know, helps to uh, to get out of this mess. So um, so I do this. So this is for bipartite graphs. So there are two special classes of graphs that I have to handle, line graphs of bipartite and bipartite. And uh, for line graphs of bipartite graphs, it's, it's not as easy that all paths have the same parity, but uh, all induced paths should have the same parity between something, and uh, you can still um, handle this. So in the perfect case, I um, find a smaller instance, OK? Um, always. So I always find an irrelevant vertex. I, the vertex in the middle, I, I say, OK, uh, if there is a, an, a, an odd ST path between you know, S and T, then I can uh, always find one which avoids this middle vertex, so I can always remove it. Um, so this is the summary of the algorithm. Uh, we check the true width, it's small, big. The true width is big. I <coughs> look at a wall. It's perfect and non-perfect. And um, uh, I either find a smaller instance and I, or I say yes. And the uh, interesting thing is that this is kind of like kernelization. So we, we only say no, no instances are only detected in the small truth case. And um, the interesting thing in this paper is that uh, there are these two words in structural graph theory that either motivated topologically or, or you work with induced subgraphs. And here we use tools and techniques from both. So we use the topological stuff and we also use the perfect um, um, graph theory. And it's five o'clock, so I guess my time is, uh, I still have five, but those are the question minutes. Yeah. Okay, okay, so uh, okay, so uh, then I want to say thank you, and I can tell you that uh, perfect walls apparently have been studied before in some uh, building science insights, which says that uh, perfect wall has to keep outside out and inside in. So uh, there's been some work in that. All right, thank you very much. One who's had problems with.